welcome everybody. Welcome at uh, the annual Schumann lecture jointly organized by Maastricht University and the city of Maastricht. I am uh, Rob van Duin, head of the Office of Studium Generale of Maastricht University, and I will moderate this evening. Uh, during the lecture, that will take about 45 minutes to an hour, you can ask your questions in the Q&A. Questions you like can be upvoted by giving it a thumbs up. And if you just want to make a remark or you have some technical issues, please use the chat. Uh, the chat we also use if you have te technical problems. And at the back end, we will do our best to help you when you have trouble with the sound or image. After the lectures, we, the lecture, we have about 40 minutes for the questions. A special welcome uh, to our guest speaker this evening, Ivan Krastev, who is joining us uh, from Vienna. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, you cannot come to Maastricht. I would have loved to have welcomed you in Maastricht at our university to talk about your views on democracy in Europe. Uh, and for you, it would have been a nice opportunity to visit your daughter, whom uh, I have learned is studying at Maastricht University uh, this year. I, in these times where due to the pandemic, our bonds, our connections, either personally within communities or international are under pressure, it is extra important to talk about this. And the power of a crisis is that it puts us on edge something is at stake again. Unfortunately, not live, but still happy that we can more meet and talk about this virtually. Let me now give the floor to Annemarie Pentestrake, to our mayor of Maastricht, to introduce the special lecture and you. A short clip by Annemarie Pentestrake, mayor of Maastricht. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome you and our honored guest speaker, Ivan Krastev, to the annual Schumann Lecture, organized by Maastricht University's Studium Generale and the city of Maastricht. The lecture Schumann is held to commemorate one of Europe's founding fathers, Robert Schumann, to keep the memory of the Treaty of Rome and the Maastricht Treaty alive. This lecture is just one of the many events organized by and in Maastricht, the province of Limburg and our university. By means of partnership, Maastricht Working on Europe, our three organizations jointly took up the effort to literally turn Maastricht into the working place on Europe. Through a focus on excellent research by cherishing the cultural heritage of the 1992 Treaty of Maastricht and by stimulating the debate and dialogue on Europe. As mayor of Maastricht, I would have loved to meet you all in real time in one of the many beautiful meeting rooms of the university or our town hall. However, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, we meet once again only digital by Zoom. We all have experienced for over a year now the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. This being also the topic of tonight's lecture. Ivan Krastev will reflect on the impact of the pandemic on the further making of Europe, our Europe, of all citizens. Ivan Krastev was born in Bulgaria in 1965 and is a political scientist. Amongst others, he is the chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and winner of the Jean Améry Prize for European Essay Writing 2020. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Crisis Group and an associate editor of Europe's World. I am sure his lecture will offer us new insight on Europe uh, after the pandemic and inspiration for all of us working on Europe. Over to you, Mr. Krastev. Thank you, Annemarie Tess Strake. The floor is yours, Ivan. Thank you very much and hello to everybody, the invisibles. Public lectures on Zoom are lonely encounters. So this is one of those long distance relationships that I do believe that we all became used to in the last year. And as you know, like any type of a long distance relationship, in order for it to survive, 
the two preconditions. One is patience, the other is imagination. So I very much pray that you're going to be patient and you're going to be imaginative. I'm here in Vienna in the Institute for Human Sciences where I'm a permanent fellow and I don't know where you are. Probably some of you at your apartments, other can ride a bicycle, the third can wash the dishes. But nevertheless where you are and nevertheless where you're listening to me, I just want to tell you that uh, I really feel very privileged for the opportunity to give this lecture. One is because in a certain way we all live uh, in the world that Schumann and his colleagues did for us. And nevertheless, how critical we can be about many things in European politics or European economy. United Europe is one of the best things that happened in at least my life. The second reason that makes me very much excited about this talk is that I saw the list of the previous speakers and this is really impressive list. For example, I saw that Stella Havras, whose book Conquering Peace I just finished some months ago and which I hope that I have written. He had been speaking in 2017. And 2018, 2019, you have two, in my view, of the finest public intellectuals of Europe. You have Michael Ignatieff and then Jung Buruma. So being on a list like this is really inspiring. And uh, as our host already told you, nevertheless, that it was surprised for him. He learned it just uh, minutes ago. My daughter is a first year student in Maastricht, so I was going to be really happy to be with you and with her because she is in Maastricht in this very moment. Also, what you don't know is that in three days she is going to turn 20. So for these 20 years, of course, I have been lecturing her all the time, uh, but she always managed to quit before I can finish my lecture. Now when I'm lecturing in her university, at least I have a hope that she is going to stay till the end. But there is one also very important reason that intellectually I find uh, this lecture special. And the reason is that it happens in a, one of those rare historical moments in which our very idea of what is possible and what is not possible in the world, our collective notion of what is possible is really breaking down. And look in our apartments, we can basically imagine the worlds that uh, normally we'll not have time to imagine. I'm saying this because experts assert that all coronavirus in the world could be put in a Coca-Cola can. There is something very small about it, but this small and almost invisible things managed to change quite dramatically our lives. I'm just trying to push you to remember the first two or three weeks of the pandemics, when really almost for a month, European Union was suspended, all the borders have been closed, we have been basically living in the shelter of our nation states, democracy was on hold, extraordinary legislation, state of emergency has been introduced in mo almost all EU member states, and even capitalism was on hold because basically for a while, almost nothing has been working and everybody expected that we are going to see a financial crisis compared to with nothing before. Now with the passing of time, of course, we start to trivialize everything that is happening. This is part of the good story of human nature. We can normalize everything. We can normalize catastrophes. We can normalize wars. Uh, and then we start to be interested in different statistics, not anymore of how many people are dying and uh, how much uh, jobs have been eliminated. Now the newspapers are going to tell other much funnier things that, for example, for this one year, we see 160% increase of the sales of the luxury sex toys in the world. So probably this is also part of uh, what happened during the pandemic times. Uh, but for me, what is extremely important is to realize the fact that exactly because many things that we did not expect happened, suddenly we start basically to unlock our imagination. For example, in March, almost no planes have been flying. And then many environmentalists that have been always dreaming for landing the planes in order to save the planet, Imagine that something that before for them was desirable but unthinkable became a reality. 
and many on the far right that have been always hoping that all the borders of Europe are going to be re-erected suddenly, so all the borders being closed. People cannot leave their countries, they cannot leave their apartments. So suddenly political imagination from every kind have been activated and we started to resemble uh, this rider who basically jumped on his horse and start riding in all directions at the same time. I'm saying all this because the first question that I want to ask is, but how radical is really the change? And now, after one year of pandemic, what we start to realize is that most of the trends that we are discussing what not, are not the new trends. In a certain way, pandemic was not a disruptor. It was accelerator. Everything that now we are preoccupied with, for example, digitalization, a kind of a Zoom, uh, discussions like this, or basically things that we had been seeing uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, how the economy is developing and certain shortening of the global supply chains, all this is if was there before. So as a result of it, it is not that as a result of the pandemics, the train on which humanity and have been boarded changed the direction. It is much fair to say that what has changed is the speed of the train. Suddenly we have moved from a very slow train to a very fast one. And what we try to basically deal with is the impact of this new speed. And then comes the second question. If this is the case, and if this COVID-19 year was such an important collective experience, are we really going to remember it? From this point of view, history is a great way to look at. And what we can see, and there is this beautiful book by Laura Spinney called The Pale Rider, which basically observes that while Spanish flu was probably the most tragic event that had happened in the 20th century, it was totally forgotten. I'm sure that many of you have heard for the first time about Spanish flu only after the COVID-19 started. According to some estimations, more people have died during the, because of the Spanish flu than as a result of the World War I and World War II together. But nevertheless, the memory of it faded away. There are 200 times more books being written about World War I than about Spanish flu. And the problem is why it's so difficult to remember the pandemics. And the answer is that probably because pandemics, unlike the war, are facing us with the meaningless death. If you're killing the war, your state is going to tell you that you sacrificed your life for others. But meaning in a pandemic, dying in a pandemic, there is no meaning. It is in a way very depressive. There is no plot. There is not morale. And as a result, people don't know how to remember it. So I'm skeptical that it was going to be our personal experience of this one year that is going to change Europe and that is going to change the way we live. So probably in order to understand what can change and what will change, we should look for something else. And very much following the advice of the magicians who said that the most difficult thing to see in our life is the things in front of our eyes. Uh, my idea is to try to think about COVID-19 and its effect on Europe very much in terms of a big social experiment and trying to see this social experiment not by learning lessons, but trying to figure out certain type of a paradoxes, contradictions, certain things that have puzzled us. Probably understanding what has puzzled us in this one year and the effect of the pandemic is going to be more useful to understand in what kind of a world we are going to live in the next years. And I'll start with the first paradox. They'll call it the globalization paradox. It is quite obvious that the pandemic makes societies much more mistrustful towards globalization. Suddenly we realize that our life is very much shaped by things that are happening on the other side of the world. When the pandemic started, we suddenly realized that most of the face masks are produced in China. Then we realized that many of the medicines that uh, we need are produced also, not simply outside of Europe, but probably just in two or three countries. Uh, and people basically started to see the pandemics as the failure of globalization. But here's the paradox. 
we became much more mistrustful about globalization, but paradoxically, globalization worked. The very fact that almost for one year, our society managed to be locked down, closed, many people for a long period of time were not getting out of their houses, and at the same time, we have been eating, we have been reading, we have been giving lectures, was the result of the fact that, strangely enough, the globalization has delivered. People have not been moving, but almost everything else was moving. It is paradoxical to know that for the last year, the decline of the maritime trade was only 4%. Suddenly, because we have not moving, we don't realize how much other things have been moving and to what extent we were not depending on humans in many of the things that basically we produced and we achieved. I'm saying this because for me this is quite important to grasp this paradox. We obviously are going to reform the globalization and I do believe this is quite important. But it is going to be wrong to believe that what we learned out of the pandemic is that globalization does not work. Because paradoxically, it worked. Even in the moments when nothing as if is happening, we are going to get all the books that we have been basically ordered, we are going to have the food that we have been ordered, we can correspond with others. The second strange impact of the globalization paradox is that, well, obviously, the, the pandemic was an agent of deglobalization, it also very much globalized our minds. In the very moment when we have been locked in our apartments, stronger than ever before we realize that we are living in a common world. I was uh, in the first uh, uh, two months of the pandemic, staying with my family in a very uh, distant uh, small village on the Bulgarian Greek border, and this is interesting to see that people who normally are not very much interested in the world outside of the country religiously followed how many people have been infected in Brazil, how many people were dying in the United States, what the governments of Australia or Germany were doing. It was in this very moment in which, as if we cannot get anywhere, that we started to live in a bigger world. And I do believe that this globalization of the mind is also something that we should realize as a real effect uh, of the pandemic. The second paradox that I uh, find quite interesting and in a certain way remarking, uh, remarkable about the pandemic is the democracy paradox. When the pandemic started, one of the biggest questions was, which countries are going to perform better? Are democracies or authoritarian regimes uh, going to do better? Are they going to be better prepared to deal with a crisis like this? Even more, more than ever before, in the last year, we start to talk about systemic competition, particularly with China, uh, and the clash between democracy and authoritarianism is more and more framing the way we see the world. But the real paradox of democracy in this one year was that while we more and more have the feeling of a growing competition between democracy and authoritarianism, in the moments of lockdown it was not so easy to distinguish between democracies and authoritarian regimes. One of the very important things that personally struck me is that it was not the nature of the regime that is going to predict better who is going to handle the pandemic, who is going to be more likely to introduce certain type of restrictive measures, who is going to be more likely to share the vaccines. Uh, suddenly, and uh, as uh, David Ranciman, the, the great uh, Cambridge political uh, philosopher here observed, in the moment of crisis like this, what is revealed is what democratic and non-democratic regime has in common that both of them are about power and order. And I'm saying this not as a criticism to democracy, but to try to realize that paradoxically, when we try to understand why some countries are doing well and others are doing badly, by the way, the countries which are doing well and countries that were doing badly all the time were changing their places, uh, suddenly the nature of the regime was not the only thing or the most important thing to help us. It appeared that effectiveness of the state the level of social trust, 
but even also the experience with a crisis like this was much more important. So as a result of it, there were democracy that performed incredibly well, and Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, a great example of this, some of the European democracies. On the other side, there was China, at least for the moment, did well. There are other kind of uh, non-democratic regimes also that did well, and there were democracy that failed, and there were authoritarian regimes that failed. So this is first part of this democratic paradox that I find quite important, and it makes it difficult for us to generalize in the way we are used to. The second interesting story about uh, 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 this is that what I see in political terms as the most important was not that the world became more authoritarian simply, because our societies have been infected with fear, but suddenly we start to live in a strange dictatorship, the dictatorship of comparisons. Now where people, particularly in the beginning of the crisis, cannot get on the street, it was illegal to protest, the oppositions basically were not much to be seen uh, because everything was uh, left to the governments, the only way people have been really controlling their governments was by comparing what they're doing with what people in other countries were doing. Comparing and comparisons. This was the most important thing that basically citizens were trying to make their governments accountable. And here is one very important part of this dictatorship of comparison paradox. In March and April, different cards of countries in the world they have a different number of people infected, they have a different number of people in hospitals, they have a different number of people uh, dying, but almost everybody uh, decided to lock down. Uh. And the question is, why so different countries? Why, in such a different situation, have decided to follow such a common action? And part of the explanation is that what was important about the pandemic is that it infected the world not so much with fear, but also with uncertainty. And it was after the Spanish flu that the great Chicago economist, Frank Knight, made a very strong and important distinction between uncertainty and risk. We all the time basically don't know exactly how the future is going to look like, but on the base of previous experience, we try to calculate the risk. When something so new, and so shocking and so fundamental, like the small coronavirus came, you don't have on the base of what to calculate. We didn't test back them, we didn't know with what to compare, and in the moment like this, first you are working with the worst case scenario, you try to imagine that the very worst that can happen and you are responding to this, but secondly, if you're a government, uh, basically you are doing what others are doing, because otherwise you're afraid that if you're going to do something else and if it fails, you're going to be blamed by your citizens uh, for the results. From this point of view, while I, I'm not a particular admirer of what the Swedish government did, I should tell you that I have a huge respect for a country that decided to take a very different course of behavior than anybody else. Being a dissident in a situation like this is not much different than being a dissident in a very authoritarian type of regime. So this type of uh, uh, comparisons, in my view, are very important because it was by comparing that people feel empowered. They can always ask their governments, why in Bulgaria, basically, you have so little tests? Why, basically, the Austrians are testing better? Why are there less people dying in Germany than they're dying in Italy? So all these things, basically, give us power in the moment in which our traditional power was taken out. But at the same time, comparisons is normalizing quite often practices. That could be dangerous. The fact that you have a situation of emergency situation, extraordinary power, almost in every state, makes you believe that this is the new normal, and from this point of view, you're going to ask much less questions than normally you're going to do. So how to compare and how to balance between the empowering side of uh, comparison and on the other side, trivializing, banalizing uh, a side of comparisons which make many otherwise quite dangerous trends look as normal and trivial. I do believe this is one of the things that personally uh, I have been uh, learning from this COVID-19 experience. And then comes the third paradox, the cooperation paradox. 
If we had this lecture, for example, three years ago, and you're going to ask me what kind of crisis can give most incentives for people to cooperate, I'm going to tell you probably a pandemic like this. Because it is not a war, it is even not kind of a migration. In a way, everybody is interested uh, this to be handled because nobody can solve the basically the crisis on its own. And we are going to understand it, in my view, in a very short time, that uh, you cannot basically solve the pandemics if it is not solved anywhere. Nevertheless, how high percent of the population in Europe or the United States is vaccinating, if the pandemic is going to destroy the rest of the world, a new mutations are going to come and these new mutations are going to attack us and basically probably some of our vaccinations are not going to work. So from this point of view, cooperation looked as something that was very natural. But it was in this one year that we see almost, particularly in the beginning, a zero cooperation. Most of the countries basically took care of their own and basically try to focus on protecting their own population. Or some of them basically uh, decided to use it very much to export power, to project power, to try basically to gain a kind of a corona dividend out of this. Uh, I'm saying this because this probably should be a lesson for us what we can expect in cooperation only when it also when it comes to a global common problem like climate change. If we were so unable to cooperate on the pandemics, and if we're not going to change something kind of dramatically, I do believe that regardless of the fact that all of the governments are producing a lot of kind of a positive noise about what should be done about uh, climate change, uh, we should be sure that uh, this should happen because the risk is that uh, many of them will not go uh, beyond the words. And uh, to be honest, many of the international relations colleagues are not going to be particularly surprised by what has happened. There was this uh, very funny book which an American uh, political scientist, Daniel Dresner, wrote some years ago, who basically was trying to explain different international relations theories on the hypothesis what the states will do if the zombies decided to attack the Earth. And one of the things that basically he's saying is that realists are going to tell us that if the zombies are going to attack the Earth, be prepared that some of the states are going to side with the zombies. Uh, don't be sure that basically humanity can act as one. And I do believe that this is what we learned from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, failure of cooperation, is uh, something that uh, should make us much more vigilant when we're trying basically to push and see how it works and what it works. Uh, and we're trying to see to what extent basically uh, you see how power has been used and, for example, many even of uh, uh, this type of a vaccine diplomacy that we have been seeing uh, on the Chinese side, on the Russian side, the way basically to undermine uh, the vaccines of the others. And then we go to the Europe paradox, and I do believe this is very central for our talk today. And there are three things about Europe experience with the pandemic which I found particularly revealing. One is that contrary to the migration crisis, it was not nationalists versus internationalists. But during the pandemic, it was at one and the same time the nationalist moment and the Europe moment. And the story is that when basically the pandemic hits the world, uh, everybody basically relied very much on their national government, everybody went home. So when people were asked to stay home, the first thing that they should decide is where home is. Uh, and it was a quite important decision. And uh, we could, for example, see in hundreds of thousands of Central and East European going back to their countries because uh, home is not simply where your parents are. From time, for most of this uh, period, you cannot see your parents much because you're risking to infect them. But home is also where you feel certain type of a cultural security, where you better understand the language, where you basically have the feeling to understand better how the society functions. Uh, but, and there was this nationalistic moment. 
borders have been closed, and by the way, everybody closed borders. But it was exactly at the moment when the borders were closed that the majority of the Europeans, even the national-minded Europeans, realized that we cannot stay in our borders, that this is over, that we're in a totally different period in which there is no kind of a, particularly in economic terms, any nationalism that makes sense. Suddenly the Austrians realized to what extent their economy depends on people who are crossing the border on a daily basis from the, uh, uh, from the neighboring countries. And I do believe that this was a very important realization. It became the European moment because suddenly Europe became for all of us a community of faith. And I'm saying this because this explains something that we have been seeing very strongly in the opinion polls, and European Council on Foreign Relations have been doing uh, one of these opinion polls, and this was even before the recovery fund has been voted. Many people have been quite critical to the response of the European Union, rightly or wrongly. They blame the European Union for not helping enough the Italians, the Spaniards in the beginning of the crisis. But regardless of this, one of the strange and very important impact of this crisis is that there is demand for more Europe. Europe is demanded more than before. And this is demanded more than before because it was during this crisis that we realized how lonely we are in the world. This was a crisis in which the American leadership was uh, totally absent in the beginning because basically uh, President Trump first didn't believe that there was uh, a, a pandem uh, that there was a coronavirus and then uh, when he realized that it is there and it is killing Americans, stopped to be interested in anybody else. But also we saw a much more aggressive power face of China and Russia. And as a result of it, what happened is that what Europeans realized is that if the world goes more polarized, more fragmented, if others are going to become more protectionist and going after their interest, the only level on which any type of protectionism makes sense is on European level. For small countries like my own Bulgaria, what it means to be protectionist in a big world like this. And I do believe that as a result of it, the talk about European sovereignty had a totally different meaning now when we have experienced the world in which Europe was not there. Particularly keeping in mind that also during the pandemic it became very clear that Europe is not the center of the world anymore. That Asia is much more important, much more people are living there, much more GDP is produced there. The major conflict, the conflict between the United States and China is taking place mainly in Asia and less in Europe. So for us, this is a new moment. For 300 years before the World War I, Europeans basically believed that Europe is the world. International order was called European order. And then during the Cold War, neither the Soviet Union nor the United States were classical European powers, but Europe was the major theater of a conflict between these two ideologies. And then in the post-Cold War, period. Of course, Europe was not the center of the world as it was before, but Europe was very much perceived as the laboratory of the world to come. We very much believe that the way we're living, the way we're organizing our societies, others are going to follow. I do believe one of the things that we realized as a result of this crisis is that probably not all the world is going to go our way, that there are people who are going to make a different choices, that what we perceive as our universalism is our exceptionalism, but we can defend things that we value only staying together. And from this point of view, uh, m at least for me, one of the major things that comes as a result of this pandemic is that it is not anymore Europe or no Europe. The real question is how powerful Europe is going to be. And uh, I do believe it's a very different question than the ones that we have been asking before. And then comes my fifth paradox before I try to say something about your generation and what kind of uh, challenge you're going to have. And this last paradox is the paradox of change. Before the pandemic, it was in the air that there is need for change. And of course, it was great that many things that before was perceived as impossible, for example, the European recovery plan, this next generation Europe, this incredible spending of 700 billion euros, uh, this mutualization of the future uh, debts, things that during the financial crisis were no go, suddenly became a common sense. Uh, suddenly, now nobody disagree about them. But while before the idea was that we should change something, we should basically try to imagine the world of the future in which we should stay competitive in order to protect our way of life, 
I'm very much afraid that one of the strange effects of the pandemic is that just going back to the world in the way it was before the pandemic is the change we're dreaming for. And this could be a risk for Europe. Because Europe, because of our age, and we're aging, because of our history, we tend to be slightly nostalgic. It was back in 2019 when the Bertelsmann Foundation did a pan-European study and it discovered that the majority of Europeans believed that the world was better, they believed that life was better before. I'm sure that they're not going to agree when this before was. It is different for different people, for different societies. But there was this idea to try to see, to idealize the past and to fear the future. And this kind of a nostalgic mood can be very strongly strengthened by the pandemic. What we're dreaming now is things that have been there before. We want to go to a coffee shops. We want to travel. We basically want to forget how we have been living for the last 14 months. And I don't see anything more natural than this. But if we're going to confine the change just to this, I do believe we're going to make a mistake concerning Europe and concerning future. And here comes the challenge of your generation. Somebody called it Generation C, Corona Generation. C could be also for sure for climate. And I see two major characteristics of your generation that are going to be of critical importance. You are small generation. You don't have numbers. The type of a generational clash when we see on different values, on different life perspectives, in many things remind me of 1968. But the difference is that the baby boomers, the generation of 1968, they have the numbers. There was a lot of them. While in your case, because of kind of a demographic decline in Europe, uh, younger generation are minority. Very important minority, but a minority. And in democratic politics, numbers matter. So what should be the strategy of the generation that does not have the numbers, but on the other side, you're going to live in the future much more than my generation? And here I see two different strategies, and I do believe that you very much succeeded in one of them, but probably underestimating the other. Minority can achieve a lot by being intolerant but basically trying to make others to understand that there are certain things that are so important for them that they're never going to make a compromise on them. And I do believe that your generation, to a great extent, succeeded to do this in many areas. Fridays for Future was one of the great examples of trying basically all the generation to care about things that we were trying to neglect. And you can achieve a lot with this strategy until the moment there's going to be a backlash against basically uh, majorities of all the people said, oh, but this is not against us, they don't understand us. And then comes the need for intergenerational coalitions. And this is something that in my view is of incredible importance. Uh, it is so important for the young people to try to see the world also with the eyes of their parents and to try to convince them to follow this kind of a minority of young people. Uh, and this is not going to stay simply. It's not enough to convince your friends, your peers, uh, people basically of your side uh, uh, of the social media, uh, what should be done. Your success is going to be very much that you should infect others. You should infect people that have experienced different than others. And uh, I see this as one of the major, major challenge that you're going to face. And the second story is that you are not simply going to live in a democracies where one of the major divides is between young and old, as was very well seen during the Brexit vote, but also you're going to live in a democracies where one of the major divides is between people with university education and people without university education. And you're going to be the most educated uh, generation, basically, that history knows. And university education is not simply the knowledge that you have, it's not simply the diploma, but it's also a very special experience. These four years that you're going to live together with your peers, discussing with them, this is when your values are going to be shaped. And I'm saying this because education is critically important, but the ideal of meritocracy on which most of our universities are built, the idea that the most competent, the most talented should govern, 
is very much into question. It is in crisis. And for me, one of the most important questions to ask ourselves is, seeing particularly many of these populist parties which managed to mobilize the vote by basically making the meritocracy, meritocracy an enemy number one. And the question is, why people who are ready to give all their money so their kids can go to the best universities in the world, when it comes to voting, they do not want to vote for parties that are going to represent the same people who come from the best universities. And while we basically can say, oh, people are doing this because they're stupid or because they don't know what to do, I just want to tell you that there are four important things that you should keep in mind in order to understand that some people's kind of disillusionment with meritocracy can be much more real and important than it looks like. The first is, unfortunately, meritocracy also means inequality. And you're going to see more and more that you're going to have a paid jobs for well-qualified people, and there are going to be less jobs and less well-paid jobs for others. But it was during the pandemic that we realized how much we depend on people who do not have university education, how much we depend on the nurses by the who saved so many people, how much you depend basically of people that allows us to function uh, during all these months. And I do believe that this kind of a balance between the head, the hand and the heart, as David Goodhart has been uh, claiming, the idea to try to recognize people not simply for their cognitive capacities, but the other things that they have is going to be critically important and meritocracy is not great at doing this because it is giving a huge prime uh, for the cognitive capacity of the persons. The second is that meritocratic elites, exactly because they achieve what they achieved through hard work and education, have the feeling that they don't own anything to anybody. Uh, one of the funniest discoveries these days is that being part of the meritocratic elite means that you're going to work as long as hours as the working class in Britain in the 19th century in the way Friedrich Engels was writing about this. If you're a top lawyer or anything top in these professions, you're going to work for 12 or 14 hours per day. So when somebody is going to tell you, but you have 50 or 60 times better pay than me, you're going to say, listen, but see how much I'm working. I'm not one of these lazy elites. I'm not one of those aristocrats that have been painting and playing piano all their life. I'm working harder than you. But the moment when you basically face the people and tell them that you don't basically depend on them, that your success is totally out of them, you should not be surprised. Uh, that you are going to be resented. And from this point of view, reinventing meritocracy, trying to see how to recognize other people, trying to recognize that some of the things that we love most, for example, our mobility, the fact that you can work as a banker in Tokyo and the next day being banker in New York and nothing is changing, is making people very distrustful if you are not a banker. I do believe if we are going to understand also these weak sides of the meritocracy and try to see how you can get the legitimacy through loyalty, but also physical courage, but also recognizing others is going to be of huge importance. I want uh, to end this lecture with uh, something very positive, and this is that uh, many psychologists believe that we're going to have a great summer. Uh, people are so much kind of longing to get out, to be with, to meet new people. So people are saying that they're going to be a really explosion of dating. They're going to be new people, they're going to be new relationships. So I do believe it is true. Uh, but when it comes to dating, there is one important task that your generation has, and this is the generation uh, task that can make or break Europe. You should basically make Europe learn again how to date the future. If we're going to stay nostalgic, if just returning to the previous normal is going to be our dream, Europe is not going to achieve what people like Schumann have believed that Europe should achieve. So have a good dating and date the future. Ivan uh, Kastev, what a beautiful way to end this lecture with a reference, of course, to uh, Schumann, which we 
uh, whom we honor with this lecture. Um, also, of course, the fact that the European Treaty was made here in Maastricht in 1990, when we started with this lecture. Um, there are questions, but um, we agreed uh, that a, a researcher working at our university would be given the uh, first opportunity to actually answer the question live. So my colleague Jaap is going to open up his microphone or ask him to unmute. There he is, Ivan uh, Rubinich. Maybe Ivan, I don't can, know if you can also can you hear me now? visible. We do hear you. Absolutely. Uh, I have problems with video, so at this moment only audio will work. Okay, maybe you can explain a little bit what your work is at our university uh, and why we actually give you the floor because you're also um, uh, uh, involved in working in working on Europe, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. So I'm currently involved uh, with Studio Europa Maastricht as a postdoctoral researcher working on Europe uh, with a particular focus on European inequalities and uh, the intersection point uh, between inequalities and the public health problem that we are facing at the moment. Hence, I would really uh, like to express my gratitude for the lecture and for the ability to provide the question to the uh, Professor Krasnev, whose work is exceptional in this area. Well, uh, and you do have a question, right, Ivan? Exactly. <clears throat> oh. Go ahead. My question is, how can a model united in diversity survive vast cross-country inequalities coupled with unmeasurable uncertainties and ethnic nationalism. To that end, how can European public health problem be solved considering the vast difference between inner country solidarity and insufficient cross country solidarity? Uh, and in, in that sense, is it possible that the supranationalization of the essential public goods is a feasible option towards restoring the progressive idea of European unity during the times of deteriorating trust and pandemic imposed fear. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, I wish I, I knew the answer of your question, but let's start first with something that uh, you already basically figured out. Uh, one of the major also differences that we saw around Europe is that when the pandemic started, we realized how different is uh, the state of the health systems. Uh, how many beds you have in one country and how many beds you have in other countries. And of course, the biggest issue was the medical personnel. My own country, Bulgaria, basically had a medical personnel which average age is above 50. So you should have imagined that in the first two months where basically there was not much protection to the people in the hospitals, the doctors and the nurses that have been taking care for the people have been older than 70. And I'm saying this because one of the big issues that we see and which in my view, unfortunately, is not going to be reversed by this crisis is that this kind of outflow of professionals, particularly from Central and Eastern Europe, is becoming a problem for these countries. Uh, I hope that I'm uh, going to be exact with the figures, but around 1,200 uh, Persons get uh, medical uh, uh, diplomas every year in Hungary. But at the same time, 950 medical doctors annually are leaving the country in order to work in other parts of Europe mostly. So you have a situation in which, and this was critically important during this crisis, the story of health and the story of helping each other cannot be measured simply in terms of money. This was about professionals. This was about who is going to care for the people. I do believe that the European Union is better than before realized it. And uh, I do believe that from this point of view, nevertheless, how critical we could be to the speed with which the vaccine politics of uh, the European Union has developed, there is something critically important because of the fact that it was the European Commission that had been buying the vaccines. Small countries like Bulgaria or Croatia or the Baltic Republics had, have been in a much better position if every of the member states was going to basically buy vaccines on their own. So there was this understanding that you cannot simply 
have the, the COVID-19 being defeated, if you're going to vaccinate it, everybody in Germany or Denmark or Austria, well, basically in the Central and Eastern Europe, basically they're not going to be vaccines. But the broader questions that you're saying, to what extent you can have a common health policies, how this is going to affect a continent in which we are aging, the number of people over 80 is going to increase, the demand for care and health care is so strong that there are going to be more and more kind of a pull from the richer European Union member states to the others to get their health professionals, how this is going to be regulated without basically constraining the right of the people to decide where they want to work and where they're going to live, in my view, is one of the most important issues. And here, the idea of solidarity really should be thinking should be thought in a very profound way because politically many of these populist anti-European nationalist parties when they go uh, in my part of the world and argue against Europe they go to all these kind of uh, old people living in a small towns in which hospitals have been closed or there are not enough doctors and they're saying what you like so much about Europe Europe is taking your kids and Europe is taking your doctors. And I do believe from this point of view, trying to find a way, even a kind of a schemes in which Bulgarian doctors who are now working in Germany can have the possibility at least for one, two months, also practice in their own countries, where you're going to have the possibility of people to be treated outside of their member states. Uh, and schemes like this probably, in my view, are going to give also much more legitimacy to the European project. But uh, even I hope that your research uh, is going to come with the answers, which, uh, honestly speaking, I'm not sure that I have. Uh, Ivan Rubinich, I hope this uh, answers your question, although uh, Ivan Krasov said at the beginning that he, he would be, it would be difficult to answer it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, it definitely points to the starting point. Okay. Well, thank you thank very you. much for opening the ball. Um, we have the Q&A. So if you move your mouse to the lower bar, you can open the window of the Q&A. You can read the questions and also upvote them by giving it thumbs up. So we're going to start with the ones who are upvoted um, at the top. Um, uh, Question by Antonio Grot here. You have lived through and written extensively about the collapse of political systems and structures during the end of the Cold War. During the early months of 2020, as you said, the EU didn't function as intended and the nation state was taking center stage. Some com uh, commentators even predicted the end of the EU. In your opinion, how close was the EU, EU to collapse? I don't know how close it was, but there was a general moment in which I do believe for several weeks, European Union was suspended, basically. It existed as a fiction, it does not exist as a political reality, and it was very clear uh, that the nation states basically have been totally in control. But then, and uh, I was trying to point to this, but then suddenly the nation states realize the limits of their own powers. They suddenly realize that uh, in the first months or two months, you can close the country, but in the way a person cannot stay all his life closed in his apartment, uh, societies cannot stay closed in their borders only. So suddenly we realized how important, not only in economics, but in any other terms, intellectual, political, all this European project is. And this is the the paradox that for me is central. People were not particularly impressed by the way the European Union responded to the crisis. As you know, even after the recovery plan, and I hope it's going to work, there was a lot of legitimate criticism of the speed, for example, of uh, the vaccines and how the vaccination goes. But strangely enough, contrary to many expectations, it was not the nationalists and the populists that benefited out of this crisis. Uh, if you're going to see, strangely enough, uh, the crisis not simply basically didn't help them uh, to get great election results, changed some of their behavior. Uh, it's enough to basically look at Italy and to see that uh, Mr. Salvini now is supporting the government of Mario Draghi, the ultimate kind of... <laughs> 
<laughs> European <laughs> technocrat in order to understand that nation states, and this is in my view quite important, nation states and national sentiment has its place in Europe. This is not about, from this point of view, the COVID-19 is not uh, an argument for a kind of European uh, federalism. But at the same time, it became clear that only by cooperating EU member states can make any relevance in a bigger world. So from this point of view, as they used to say, if the European Union did not exist in April 2020, it should have been <laughs> invented, uh, because otherwise the relevance of a small and mid-sized uh, uh, nation states that are basically populating our continent are going to become uh, uh, very much visible, and then Europe really is going into irre irrelevance. But you ask a question, the first part of it, which I found also critically important. One of the things that you get of the fact that you have been living to the collapse of a political system, and this was the case of what we saw, my generation, uh, in Eastern Europe in the 1980s, is that you understand how fragile every political project is. Listen, in the late 1980s, Bulgarian communist system looks as stable as nature. People can basically imagine how their life was going to go for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And then, really over weeks, everything is changing. And the major story was how it happened that all this type of political machines, police machines, that they have been doing so much to know what people think, what people say, what people do, how they missed the moment in which the system totally collapsed. And I do believe that this is a very institutionally important moment. What, in my view, is the most risky in the crisis is that if we basically take for granted everything that we see and we are basically unable able, uh, to see the volatility of our own systems. So from this point of view, one of the most important things after every crisis is, is it reaffirming certain type of a status quo? Or is it helping the system to change, to adjust, uh, to basically reposition itself? And in the case of the European Union, particularly also in the case of how our economies are going to work, uh, this is still not very clear. We're going to know the results in one year, in two years, in three years. We survived the crisis, but surviving the crisis is not enough because if we lose flexibility, if we lose capacity to readjust, the next crisis is going to be a much more painful one. And this is the things that basically, personally, I have learned uh, 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 in my uh, own experiences that there is this very badly guarded border between resilience and decay. Uh, when basically people started to talk too much about resilience, I always knew that resilience also includes the possibility for dynamic change. Resilience is not simply that you're not allowing others to change you, but resilience also means that you have the capacity to change if you decide to do it. And this is very important, because otherwise we have seen regimes that have been quite resilient uh, till they realize that basically it's not a resilience, it's decay. Because even if they wanted to do a change, they don't have any more the capacity to do it. So from this point of view, uh, the question of Europe resilience is still an open question. But I do believe that as a particularly as a popular support, uh, there is a much more consensus on the need of the European Union than there was before the crisis. It depends, of course, uh, what the future will bring. Yeah. Um, because you mentioned uh, uh, Italy as an example, but in Spain, uh, the populist party, of course, in Madrid won a lot of votes, and maybe because of the crisis, and maybe because of the anti-European. No, you're right. Uh, in a certain way, let's be uh, let's be fair. It was quite populist and quite right-wing. You're not going to call them openly anti-European because it was much more anti-Spanish government than basically anti-Europe. But the most interesting story is that, uh, and uh, here you're absolutely right to bring the Spanish example. What was interesting with uh, the elections in Madrid was that we are going to see a major clash about our definition of freedom. Who is the major threat of freedom? Before, basically, we, we used to believe, and there was a kind of a common sense, that threat to freedom is coming mostly from the extreme authoritarian movements outside of the system. And then, basically, the mayor of Madrid said, no, it was the mainstream governments, people who are basically not allowing to, to 
he have a normal life to get on the streets. This is where the cha challenge uh, uh, and threat on freedom is. And redefining what freedom means, in my view, is going to be one of the major political issues as a result of the pandemic. And this is going to be different because uh, different political parties and different political ideas are trying to reformulate what freedom means. And here we should also not be complacent. Listen, of I, I'm a person who believes that most of the lockdowns have been totally legitimate. It does not mean that people should not be allowed to question this. Because the most important about the state of emergency, is in the, which makes it very different between the democratic and non-democratic states, is we have the right to look back and to see what was legitimate, what was not legitimate, what was done in order to make life easier for the people and what was done in order to make the life easier for the governments. Uh, and I do believe this conversation is fine. I do believe that this conversation should take place and we should, be, we should not try to suppress a kind of a difficult questions that are going to come because the more you're suppressing these questions, the more basically the border between resilience and decay uh, became more vulnerable. Next question by uh, Christina Meyer. I was wondering whether those dictatorships are really perform performing as good as some democracies, since we cannot be sure whether they are transparent about the numbers and methods. Listen, this is a great question. So from this point of view, when it comes to numbers, I was always very much following one kind of statistics that I found more revealing. And this is the excessive death. This is not how many people you claim basically has died because of the pandemic, but how, more, how many more people have died uh, during this year than what you can expect on the base of the average number of uh, uh, deaths uh, in the previous years. And from this point of view, uh, I do believe that uh, 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 our colleague is right, but uh, because you're going to see some countries that basically claim uh, that they did relatively well. Russia is such a state. And then when you see the level of the excessive deaths, uh, it's very high. It's, in fact, was the second highest. Uh, uh, but on the other side, you can compare. And this is compare not what they're much reporting, but you are comparing, as I told you, excessive deaths. And also what you're comparing is some economic parameters that basically are comparable. Uh, but here comes the interesting story. This is also when you are comparing, when we are going to decide who did well and who did badly. Six months ago, many people are going to very much praise Germany and Germans are going to praise themselves. So now basically they are in a less kind of a euphoric <laughs> situation of how well they're doing. Six, eight months ago, Central and East European countries, contrary to all expectations, were doing very well. And I remember people asking me, why Central Europeans have so <laughs> low cases? Why are you doing so well? So nobody is asking this question anymore. They're asking just the opposite question. Because Central and East European countries uh, have been one of very much damaged by what happened with the new wave. So strangely enough, even for countries like China or Russia, uh, China, for the moment, of course, they manage uh, to contain the virus and uh, they manage to export incredible amount of vaccines in the world. But one of the interesting stories, both in China and Russia, they're selling vaccines outside of their countries. They're not vaccinating their population much. Strangely enough, the trust uh, in Sputnik vaccine, and this could be a good vaccine, so it's not a judgment on vaccines. I don't understand anything on vaccines. is higher outside of Russia than within Russia. Uh, so if everything is then, you don't know how it's going to be in six months, in eight months. So strangely enough, in every single moment, we try to answer the question, who have won the war? The problem is that the war is not over. Uh, and paradoxically, the war is not going to be over unless all this kind of a virus is going to be under control everywhere. Uh, and this is, this is the major issue. India, six months ago, People are asking, they have a much less uh, kind of damage than you can expect. Now you can see what is going on. And of course, all these mutations that are taking place uh, can bring back uh, uh, the pandemic. So one of the interesting story about post-pandemic world is that most probably, this is not going to be the world without Corona. This is simply going to be the world in which Corona is not this type of a, a catastrophe that we are seeing. And, and this is, in my view, also pushing us to think in a different terms about 
everything that we're experiencing, uh, we, are, we cannot live with the expectations that they are not going to be challenges, that they are not going to be risks. And talking about Europe, one of the things, honestly speaking, that make me nervous during this one year is that government starts to promise people things that even God never dared to promise, almost immortality. For example, you go with every vaccine, and even when you have a very small statistical kind of uh, cases that you know that every time is going to happen, we are saying, oh, but it is not 100% uh, risk-free. I don't believe that anything is risk-free. Uh, even basically in Vienna, crossing on, red, uh, on the green traffic light, there are risks. There is that somebody can hit you. So from this point of view, I do believe it's very important for us not to go in this risk averse mode. I know that people and the governments are doing this because people really expect their governments to do everything possible to them. Uh, but promising the world to is a very low risk while we understand that there are going to be more and more risks coming from different stories because of technology that we are adopting and we are using. There are going to be more and more unintended consequences. So when we talk about resilience, we normally talk about resilience on the level of society, on the level of the state. But I do believe we should talk also resilience on the level of individual. Uh, because suddenly, from time to time, I have the feeling that we have lost resilience and it took a virus to remind us some very obvious things, for example, that we are mortal. I guess uh, it's a sign of the times that we uh, learn less how to deal with risks or we try to take them away. <clears throat> Next question, Boris Bloomberg. Uh, Mr. Krastev, you were talking about the power of the comparison that is used to make governments accountable. But doesn't this pandemic also teach us how difficult it is to obtain reliable and valid information and data, let alone to draw conclusions regarding causal effects. Thus, is that power of the compar comparison not very short-lived at the base numbers are often not reli reliable and valid? It's actually quite kind of the same question we... No, no, this is, uh, I do believe, also the very important and very legitimate question, because when the pandemic started, one of the expectations, and I was one of the persons that was sharing these expectations, was that we are seeing a much more trust in expertise, basically this kind of a crisis of trust that we have seen in, uh, for example, related to the financial crisis is slightly going uh, uh, to be overcome, that we're going to recover the trust, because now, of course, it's much easier to trust your doctor than uh, basically the, uh, the chief economist of uh, your national bank. Uh, but here the interesting story is that on one level, for sure, the science worked. And the fact that we have these vaccines uh, one year after the pandemics and many people vaccinated shows that science worked. But also what happened was that it is quite clear that for many people, the essence of the science, mainly that scientists disagree between themselves, that they're basically going to argue about including certain comparisons and management, was perceived as the way that nothing should be trusted and nothing could be trusted. Uh, so suddenly the crisis of trust uh, didn't diminish as a result of these pandemics. And I very much also agree that uh, the governments, and here people have absolutely right to be uh, mistrustful, uh, decided to pick up certain type of uh, data that works for them, certain type of comparisons that works for them. If you're going to see what kind of comparisons every government is putting in front of their public, you're not going to be surprised that they're always going to get the comparisons that works best for them. Uh, and this makes people, uh, in a very difficult position, but my major argument was that in a moment like this, imagine that you don't know what others are doing. And then it becomes even more difficult to have any control over the government. And uh, the fact that at the same time, the information cannot be covered easily these days anymore. In a certain way, one of the reasons I do believe that some of the governments decided to be overcautious about certain vaccines and other things was the fact that they really, really were totally paralyzed by the fear that their citizens are going to have the feeling that they're covering certain information. 
So as a result of it, basically, this was one of the most important things that happened during this pandemic. The moment the governments decide to cover certain information and it is going to be revealed, I do believe that the government starts to have a problem. Uh, but the idea that you're going to have too many comparisons, that and everybody is going to find certain type of a data that works relatively well for them, uh, this is absolutely valid and we're going to see more of it. And this is also interesting when we talk about all this uh, infection of conspiracy theories, of uh, disinformation that uh, a lot of colleagues have been recently uh, writing about. One of the things that struck me is the following. When we talk about misinformation, normally we talk about how misinformed others are. Uh, I almost never met a person who told me I'm the victim of misinformation. Uh, but basically, I saw a lot of people and talked to a lot of people who basically are saying, listen, I talked to somebody and he was totally misinformed. And he was totally misinformed because he had a view different than mine. So uh, from this point of view, this is becoming quite important to try to understand that facts, even when they're correct as effects, put in a certain frame, manipulated in a certain frame, can have the same kind of a disinformation effect like a open lie and even much more powerful than this. And, uh, and the re reason for this, at least in my view, spread of conspiracy theories is also the fact that we're living in a world in which our personal experience is less and less relevant. Normally the idea of the common sense means that we have enough experience with the world around us and this allows us to be equally competent when it comes to our common life, when it comes to politics. Now many things that happened in politics are not based on something that we have a personal experience with. Uh, very few of us knows how certain type of a vaccines works or what should be done about this and that financial issues. And this makes people uh, very mistrustful. And this is an important, uh, at least for me, this was one of the central theme in my work. I do believe that democracy needs mistrust. When basically people start trusting too much their governments, it does not end well. And if you don't believe it, ask the generation of our parents in Eastern Europe. Uh, but there is also a certain level of mistrust that becomes totally disempowering. Samuel Johnson, uh, a Brit before Brexit, some centuries before, used to say, better be cheated than believing nobody. And I do believe that this kind of a generalization of mistrust, the idea is I cannot trust anybody, I cannot trust anything, is becoming a major problem for any idea of a social and political change. Mistrustful people cannot change societies because in order to change a society, you should be ready to trust somebody. And does this, this mistrust become more visible because of this pandemic? Did you, totally. It's Listen, already if you there, see, but it becomes more visible? It became more visible. It becomes also, to be honest, much more dangerous. Uh, because if till yesterday we have been talking about the lack of vaccines, now, particularly in the United States, you can see it's, it's not about the lack of vaccines anymore. It's basically no people who wants to be vaccinated. And these people don't want to be vaccinated because they fundamentally mistrust what the governments are saying, what basically scientific community is saying. And most of these people are going to have a very sound uh, academic argument coming from other doctors. Uh, and I do believe this is a situation in which mistrust can be empowering. And in a democracy, mistrust wasn't empowering. But there is certain qu quantities of mistrust when they inject it in a society, when it becomes totally disempowering and basically paralyzing our possibility for collective action. Thank you for that answer. Um, Manti, I'm not going to pronounce the last name, it's too difficult for me, or Chatsi Michalidu. Um, it was mentioned that the globalization of the mind plays an important role on the effects of the pandemic of COVID-19. Could you explain this sentence in a more deep way, please? So yeah, listen. Globalization of the mind. Yeah. What I mean is the following, that suddenly, exactly in the moment in which everybody was locked down, closed, two things happened. Uh, you can basically change uh, all the TV channels that you have on your satellite, and nevertheless that you don't know during the primetime news most of the languages on the which the news have been delivered, you know what people were talking about because they were talking about one and the same thing. They were talking about corona, they're talking about pandemic, they were 
talking what is happening in the world. And suddenly, uh, many people who otherwise were not very much interested in what is happening outside of uh, their town or what is happening outside of their state, realized to what extent their life, in the most direct sense of it, depends on something that happens thousands of kilometers <laughs> far away. Secondly, with digitalization and the moment that because of the pandemics, many people that have not been using so much internet and others uh, were very much relying on it. Uh, suddenly, it's, uh, it was not deglobalization, it was delocalization. Suddenly, you, you were equally close to everybody. Uh, some of your relatives living somewhere in Brazil was as close to you as your physical neighbor, because anyway, you cannot leave the house. You cannot uh, meet him, you cannot uh, uh, talk to him on the street. And I do believe this realization that you're living in a common world, which was something that political scientists or economists and so on are uh, saying all the time, but it's not an everyday experience for many people. Suddenly, because of the pandemic, it became a common experience. And this is what I do believe really globalized our mind, is that suddenly you understand that you're living in a world which does not end up on your borders. Uh, and everything that is happening to you, and you realize it not on a theoretical level, not because you read something, you're just experiencing this, and you start to be interested in things that normally you're not interested in. Thank you. Next question, again, one by Antonia Gott here. Antonio, sorry. Uh, whilst, whilst I was reading the concluding remarks of your book, After Europe, it felt as if you were describing a situation in which Armageddon is right around the corner with Europe facing a desperate situation at the end of 2016. I was left with this image of an inve inevitable populist wave, yet from what I've gathered from your publications during the pandemic's year, earlier stages, you predicted that populism would somehow uh, fade away and that the people would listen to the voices of reason once more. Looking back at the last 12 months, has this been the case? Yeah, L listen, I do believe that populism is going to stay with us and I do believe it's part of the democratic politics. So from this point of view, what has changed and why I don't believe that populist parties have been the big winners, as some people predicted, are three reasons. First, psychologically, uh, my argument uh, is that in a certain way at the heart of support, popular support for populism, psychologically is this sense of anxiety. You have the feeling that the world is going into a wrong direction. Something is not in the way you expected it. And then for you it's very important to find somebody who is going to express and represent your anger, your disorientation. You basically want somebody who feels the world like you. And there were some important politicians that have been uh, found there. In the moment of the pandemic, it was not about anxiety, it was about fear. You fear death, you fear your own death, you fear the death of your parents, uh, of your relatives. And then suddenly, it's not about, you're not looking for somebody to express how you feel. It's very much trying to find somebody who is going to help you to survive. And this is not by accident that basically it was the governments and not the oppositions that in the beginning of the crisis uh, very much were rewarded with this. Of course this can change and from this point of view also populism is changing. Populism of 2015-2016 was very much the product of the migration crisis uh, and this populist part is very much built a identity on the problem of migrations and the fear of migrations and suddenly with the COVID-19 there was no migration. <laughs> nobody was moving, nobody was crossing borders. Uh, suddenly, uh, uh, this kind of a disappeared even more. When migrants have been in some of the, uh, in our states, people realize that you cannot treat them differently. Uh, Portuguese government very early uh, during the pandemic said, we're not going to make a distinction between citizens and non-citizens, because if you're just going to provide health uh, and medical services uh, to the citizens and leaving non-citizens to get infected, this is not going to end well. So from this point of view, also the disappearance of migration not simply reduced the support of some of the parties, but also basically uh, changed them. Uh, and as I uh, already mentioned, suddenly this idea that Europe 
is very much lonely, that you should try to find much more power, that we cannot do it. I do believe this also had a very important role for people like Salvini and others who realized that without the money coming from Brussels, without the money of this recovery fund, basically how Italy is going to survive the economic uh, uh, consequences of this. Does it mean that basically the populist parties are going to disappear or that they're going to be always on the losing side? I don't believe this. And I don't believe this because first, uh, there are going to be some important economic consequences, also because people are going to react to certain things that they do believe that governments falling in love with the state of emergency and basically restricting rights and doing things like this. But thirdly, uh, and for me this is very important because Populism is not now characteristic just of a single party. This is very much about transformation of how, how our democratic systems works. This is very much about personalization of the leadership, the decline of the ideological parties. Uh, and I do believe from this point of view, many things are changing. Uh, what is going, uh, in my view, also to happen is that we're going to see that this type of a populist mobilization they can have a different impact in different places. These days I was very much watching what is happening in places like Poland. Highly uh, important and very polarized society with uh, quite nationalistic uh, government in power, very much the one that traditionally have been opposing European Union, particularly on the value issues. Uh, but because of the fact that the governing party decided to weaponize many of the conservative ideas that have been in society before, they destroyed a certain conservative consensus that existed before. Polish society had been, uh, for very important uh, reasons that we can discuss, quite conservative on issues like gay rights, gay marriages, and so on. So this kind of conservative consensus was going much outside of the governing party. But now, because the governing party made uh, the war on the gay rights and others, its major platforms, Many people who otherwise are not particularly supportive for gay marriages, they're never going to attack them anymore. Because attacking them means that they're going to be identified as the supporters of a government they don't like. And I do believe this type of a changes that goes on different level is also something that is part of this populist challenge. And uh, as a result of it, I don't believe we're going to be back where it was. Many people don't understand to what extent the political and the party systems of the Cold War period, he had been very much preconditioned on the Cold War. He had been preconditioned on a totally different type of economy. So there are going to be a changes. Uh, but uh, my feeling, at least for the moment, is that in the last 12 years, uh, the populist uh, parties and populist leaders have not been the greatest uh, 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 winners of, uh, 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 of the crisis. Because they like crisis, but they like the crisis that they create themselves. This was not one of those crises. It's not like you said that a lot of uh, uh, things accelerate in this period because yeah. of the crisis that the populist uh, movement will accelerate. Yeah. But in your view. <clears throat> Anthony Bloomberg, you explained how the pandemic led to an eventual deepening of the European Union, such as the establishment of a strong European health union, for example. Would you say the pandemic might also lead to a widening of the union? an enlargement uh, on, on this unfortunately i'm less uh, less convinced for several reasons uh, and the reason is that one of the major reasons th this is enough to see basically how also the union functioned during the pandemics as somebody uh, who basically following the western balkans i find it really shocking to see that European Union that have basically buying millions of doses and trying to basically distribute to the member states and so on, didn't manage to find 20,000, 40,000 doses, for example, to give to the medical personnel in North Macedonia. And it was the Serbian president, Mr. Vucic, uh, who basically should give this to them. The same was Albania, which basically get their vaccination from Turkey. So paradoxically, while on one level, we saw much more European solidarity when it comes to the vaccines within the Union. I do believe that we kept our borders quite closed on this. And this is something that also we see on the level of the nation states. The member states showed much more readiness to redistribute within the 
member states trying basically to support uh, uh, the weaker part of societies during this crisis than to try to take care of people nearby who probably go through a much deeper crisis. It could change, but for the moment I'm quite skeptical about this because also European publics at the moment is much more inward working. The idea is we should try to consolidate what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, for the moment, and particularly with a kind of a very difficult institutional environment which the European Union has, where every almost single country can veto any important decisions, uh, the idea of the new member states and the idea enlargement for many people is, are we really ready to import more vetoes? And as you ask the question like this, the answer is no. Next question by Fabrizio Ferraro. You commented on uh, merit meritocracy and democracy. The ineffective, ineffective reaction of most Western democracies in early March 2020 to the first pandemic warning signs from China showed a very poorly effective geopolitical risk management cap capabilities by most leaders of Western democracies. How is it possible to combine merito meritocracy? Meritocracy, oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's, yeah, it's a bit difficult for me. Sorry about that. According to which the best people should lead nations and democracy where the leaders are elected by the majority of the people who are probably unable to distinguish who the best people are? Listen, that's a great question. The best people, uh, in our case, quite often means best educated people. Best educated people are not always the people that are going to lead you best in the time of crisis. Because in the time of crisis, there are certain things that are quite important and it goes beyond the cognitive capacity of the leader. You can be very smart, but in the moment of crisis, you should be also quite decisive. You should be ready to take risks. And this is not something that basically comes with your PhD. Uh, uh, this is something that is very much about character. This is also try to understand better how people feel and how they react to this or that. So from this point of view, I still believe that meritocracy is quite important and giving possibility for people to compete is critically important. But part of the geopolitical negligence uh, of European leaders that you point out, and which I very much agree with you, is the result of the fact that Europe is find it very difficult to depart with the idea that the world is not like we wanted it to be. Uh, in a strange way, uh, we have been so much accustomed to the fact that, for example, economic interdependence produced security. This is very important. This is on what Europe is based. But historians are teaching us that this is true only in the case that both sides have a equally positive trade expectations. If one of the sides does not believe this, then economic interdependency also can increase the risk of war. So from this point of view, the idea of a much more cooperative world, which best fits to the strengths of Europe, is something we are so attached to that we find it difficult to recognize the risk when we see them, because if we're going to recognize, for example, that what China is doing is not simply trade, but power trade, that many of the things that Americans are doing is also very much rooted in power, uh, then the world, in a way, we see it. We don't like it, because also we don't feel competitive enough in this world. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is a huge, uh, huge issue. Also, when it comes to the world around us, something dramatically changed in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, five even years ago, but 10 years ago, before the financial crisis, the major question Europeans are asking when they see the map was how we're going to transform others. Uh, and then suddenly, with all this crisis, with what happened in Ukraine and other places, then the question was, are the others going to transform us? So from this point of view, Europe is in a difficult moment in which certain things that we believe are very universal in our experience, we see much more as exceptional. Not all others are ready to share our view of the world. So if I can use a metaphor, and I have been using it before, uh, over a decade, European Union has turned from a missionary into a monastery. <laughs> 
uh, in a certain way before we were very much trying to convert others and now we are much more trying to claim that in the world there is a place which is ready to live by different rules and European Union is this place. Thank you. Um, last question because we're actually running out of time and there's still like 17 questions uh, uh, to be answered which we cannot manage. So I'm suggesting to, to just Uh, give the floor to the last one, uh, Jan Wojak. Do you think we will manage to battle the climate crisis with a democratic system where there's a big amount of people that underestimate the problem? Is a totalitarian climate-oriented government approach a possible solution to the problem? Listen, it's, it's true. Some of the things that can be done are very unpopular. What we know about authoritarian governments is that they have a much more capacity to implement unpopular policies. But then comes the story is if a government is very much authoritarian at home, if maximization of their own power is basically the major principle on which the state is run, why they should care so much about global type of uh, uh, values like uh, 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 climate change? So. In a certain way, I'm not going to say that uh, authoritarian governments, particularly capable governments, for example, the Chinese and others, uh, are not going to have much stronger and kind of a faster results on certain type uh, of policies when it comes to climate change. But at the same time, I cannot imagine that climate change is going to be the top priority for any authoritarian government. Because if the top priority of any authoritarian government is really to take care of the general environment and how people feel, probably they were going to be also less afraid of their own populations and probably they're going to give them much more important uh, to have uh, a voice in the decision-making process. But where I'm going strongly to agree with you, the fact that a country is a democracy does not mean that this country is going to be, one, more ready to face the climate uh, problem and two that it's going to face it better so any type of a issue that we are facing we cannot answer simply by saying because we're democracy we're going to do it better we're going to do it better if our societies and our governments decide to do it better we can also be democracies which can decide not to do it better and we have shown that it also can be done um, well i want to thank you although i see one very short question that maybe can answer it very quickly uh, by uh, Shania Bryden, Bryden. What is the name of the political scientist that researched the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis of zombies and cooperations? Daniel Dresner. A name. Daniel Dresner. Daniel, Daniel Dresner. Dresner. Yeah. It's, it's this is a proper funny. answer. So on this answer, I know that I gave the right, that this question, I gave <laughs> the right answer. So it's a very, it's very nice from your side that you allow me to end up with the right answer. Right. Uh, although I do want to thank you, of course, for a very, very interesting uh, uh, lecture, which makes us uh, think a lot about um, the way we perceive our, uh, this crisis and also, of course, the democracy and, the, uh, and Europe. Um, I really did like um, the, the end of your lecture also, where you address the, the younger people, our students in this case, uh, since they are a, a minority, uh, still uh, it's their future we're talking about. And it's very important that they uh, somehow get a voice or maybe take a lead, uh, see in the future, of course. We don't have a, we don't have a glass ball that gives, tells us what is going to happen, but you sketched some nice uh, views on, um, basis of your own knowledge and insights on the EU and what is going to happen after the pandemic. Uh, maybe we will have to ask you back indeed to see uh, where we are in a year from now, maybe a bit later. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan Krastev. Um, people who want to thank you can also leave something in the chat. I already saw in the Q&A uh, many people saying thank you very much for this interesting evening and interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.